Hi, everyone. Welcome to the February 25th edition of the Timeform U.S. Forecast. I'm David Aragona here with my usual co-host, Craig Milkowski, to do some handicapping of this weekend's card at Oaklawn Park. Saturday is Rebel Day. The grade two Rebel offering 50 Kentucky Derby qualifying points to the winner is carded as race 11 on a 12 race card at Oaklawn Park. We're going to talk about the entire late pick five sequence, and it's not the easiest one. We've got an Arkansas bread allowance race to close things out, a couple maiden races before that, an interesting allowance race kind of sandwiched in between things. And of course, that Rebel, the penultimate race of the sequence. I would imagine that the Bob Baffert trained New Grange is going to be a pretty short price in there, Craig. Uh, obviously, he would not accrue those 50 Derby qualifying points if he won. But if you're going to take a shot against that favorite, I think there are a lot of ways to go. We'll get to that race eventually. But I thought there were some fun things to highlight in this sequence. Yeah, it looks like a decent card. Uh, it's the the weather is a bit iffy, cold, might be rainy. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on tomorrow if you're planning on playing the card. But it's a little bit different Rebel card. It's moved up in the calendar. It's not as uh, stakes loaded as it has been in the past, but. Uh, Oakland finds a way to fill these races. Uh, every race has a big field that we're going to talk about and most on the entire card. So very tough handicapping challenge. No, I think we've been saying it for the past few months. As far as dirt racing goes, Oakland really is putting out the best product right now anywhere in the country. And uh, that's pretty much exemplified in this sequence because we've got some large fields to talk about and some really interesting maiden races with some well-bred horses going out for some live barns. And let's start off with that theme, Craig, and dive right into the beginning of this pick five sequence in race eight. It's a three-year-old maiden special weight going the two-turn mile in the 16th around the Oval at Oakland Park. And I would imagine we're going to have a substantial favorite in here in the Brad Cox trained quick to blame. This is a horse that's really done nothing wrong so far in his career, except he just hasn't visited the winner's circle yet. But I think he's run well in all of his starts. And uh, he put in a good effort last time, was just beaten by a horse that kind of ran off the screen at Ethereal Road, who we'll probably talk about a little bit more later. But I thought quick to blame ran well to be second in there. And I think everybody else in this race, if they're going to beat him, they're going to really have to step up. Yeah, it's a horse I, I couldn't really find any knocks on him. He's uh, improved his time form U.S. speed figure every time out, uh, all the way up to a 96 last time, which is the best in the field. There are a couple others who have run in the 90s, but like Life on the Nile is one of them. He's basically the horse he battled with all the way around the track and was able to handle him pretty well as that one faded back to fifth while he was able to hold on for second. Curly Tail was in that same race, ran a 90 speed figure, but he was just kind of picking up the pieces late. So I... I I think he's really the horse to beat. Uh, he's going to be featured prominently on my ticket for sure. A couple other horses did interest me. I'm glad this sequence is early and first so we can see the tote board. The one I don't really get is the second choice on the morning line, Western River uh, by Rudolph Brissett. He's a horse who comes off of a decent try in a turf race back in September of his two-year-old season at Ellis Park. That has come back to be a, a pretty decent turf race with the runbacks, but it was on turf. So I'm really not sure what to make of him. My gut is I, I don't really like him in here, but I do want to see the tote board and what it says. Uh, the other horse that, that I am interested in is far to the outside riders special coming in for Steve Asmussen. Um, it's just a horse who's adding blinkers. I think his last race was a lot better than looked. It, it was a much improved race over his debut. And it's one where the running line doesn't look like much. But he really did have trouble at the start. He was having trouble fighting the rider a little bit. He seemed like he was trying to get in. So of all the horses in the field that I think could really improve, he's the one with the addition of blinkers. Yeah, I agree about quick to blame and being a uh, way the horse to beat. And I, he's not the kind of favorite I would take a stand, a strong stand against. I would probably use one other horse in conjunction with him in a pick five sequence and maybe a few backups. But uh, I would want a good chunk of my play to be going through him because I do think he's a very likely winner of this race. Uh, it's a tough one for me because as for that horse that you mentioned, Craig, second, uh, the number six Western River, 
handicapping these races at Oakland, I feel like I have to have the morning line on paper and then separate that from the morning line I'm making in my head. And sometimes I'm right. Sometimes the morning line maker's right. But I feel like there's no way this horse is going to be the second choice in this race. I don't I don't get set for the two on this horse just based on his prior speed figures. I know they came as a two-year-old and he's going out for a barn that has won a couple races at this meet and I've sent out some horses that have taken some money, but I don't know with, with this particular runner, I don't see him going off nearly that short. And I actually like some of this horse's races. I think he looks, I think he's better than he looks on paper. His one dirt start going back to his debut. He was just really green that day. Didn't look like what he knew what he was doing. And then off the turf race running along at the back of the pack. And it's not really apparent when you look at the running line on paper, but when you go back and watch the race, he was actually figuring things out at the very end and was quickly running by horses as they passed the wire and just kind of felt like a horse that is really going to appreciate these longer route distances eventually. And maybe that eventually is going to be now in February of his three-year-old season because they ran him on turf a couple times and he did take steps forward. As you said, he comes out of a race that got a low speed figure, but it might be stronger than it seems. The winner ready to perform came back to win a stakes race. And Western River, it should be noted, while he only sold for $30,000 as a yearling, uh, Perhaps that's not a good sign, but when you look up his pedigree, he's a full brother to Creator, who won the Arkansas Derby. So he certainly bred to be a dirt horse, and I guess he wasn't the prettiest looking horse when he sold as a yearling, but maybe he's matured since then. And I think he's pretty interesting uh, getting into this spot because this is supposed to be what he wants to do. And again, I would be looking for a price that around six to one or higher on him. And I, I think there's a possibility we get that because I don't think he's going to take quite as much money as is indicated on the morning line. As for some of those horses that are towards the outside, uh, I gave a long look to that horse. You mentioned Riders Special. Uh, speaking of auction purchases, I don't know how this horse sold for $425,000. As a son of Union Rag, I did watch his two-year-old sales workout and I would say he worked fast, but it was not pretty. Uh, he's got, as you noted, he, he's got a weird way of running. He kind of runs with a really high head carriage. It's, he, he doesn't run like a horse that's giving a genuine effort. And he even looked that way in the sales workout. I mean, I'm no expert in horse flesh, but I feel like sometimes these horses work fast and they just automatically sell all regardless of the visual. Uh, but yeah, I rider special does not look like a typical union rags to me. And I just want to see him, uh, kind of show that uh, interest in competing in the afternoon before I back him. But he does figure to be a price in this race. A horse that I, I kind of was going back and forth on is the number nine curly tail. Actually, both the nine and 10 are owned by uh, Willis Horton. They're, they're, they're kind of stable mates, though they go out for different trainers with curly tail being trained by Dallas Stewart. And um, he has no early speed. He just goes out the back early and tries to pass as many runners as possible. I mean, he, he couldn't close in tandem with Ethereal Road last time, and that race the quick to blame was second in because Ethereal Road just kind of swooped past the entire field. But I did think that Curly Tail was making up some good ground late. Uh, we'll see how much pace he gets to close into this time, but he just kind of felt like one of these horses, a son of Curlin, that was steadily improving and slowly figuring things out. And I wouldn't be surprised if he takes another step forward here. So I'm mostly on quick to blame and Western River, but I use some of those horses drawn towards the outside as distant backups. Let's move on to race nine, the second leg in this sequence, Craig. And I think this is one of the more interesting races we're going to talk about in this sequence. It is a allowance race, uh, nominers of two lifetime with a also another condition, nominers of, uh, I think, a certain amount of purse money, 15,000 uh, once in their career. So a lot of different types of horses could enter this race. Uh, the pace is something that I do think we have to discuss as we get into some of the contenders, because as I go through this field, I count a lot of horses that want to be forwardly placed and they can't all secure the front end. And I think a lot of them do want to get that trip where they're controlling. And I feel like something has to give on the front end. Yeah, I agree. It's the one the pace projector has with a fast flag, and uh, it's hard for me to argue with it. I mean, it's a big field of 12, uh, a lot of horses in here, both inside and outside figure to show speed. So it's one of those puzzles where you, you kind of got to figure out who's going to be able to outrun who, and uh, it, it's a tough one for me. I, I really don't know. I think post position is going to come into play. I think it'll probably favor the inside horses that want to go, and 
the outside speed horses, I, I give less of a chance because of that. But there's still a horse that, that has shown speed that I actually have to use in here, and that's a horse drawn inside Pat's property. He's went wire to wire, uh, tried to go wire to wire last time. He, he barely got run down late the time before that. He, he went wire to wire in a starter allowance. And he's just been running speed figures that a guy like me, I'm not going to be able to resist at 8-1. to one. Uh, So I'm going to have to use him pretty prominently in here as an A-horse. That said, I, I do recognize that there's a ton of speed in here. I, I'm just kind of hoping he's going to be the speed of the speed. If you want to look for some, for some horses that are going to close, I, I think it's not all that clear, clear cut. The one I actually landed on is, and is going to be a price is a guy who's well known in racing, but really doesn't win very often anymore. But I think the best closer in here is pretty clearly Hunt for the Front, the six horse, based on the speed figures. He's coming off off of a short layoff, but that's something uh, Nick D, Nick Zito does better than he uh, his his ratings are a lot better with that than just his standard every uh, every day horse that he runs. So I think at fifteen to one, he he's a horse you have to give a look to as well. Yeah, I think you make a really interesting point uh, about the pace and kind of starting the conversation with that number one Pat's property because if you've watched this horse's last two races. Kelsey Har, she sends this horse. I mean, she wants to get to the early lead and breaking from the rail. You have to imagine that even though she's not, this horse uh, is not shown on the front end of the pace projector that, I mean, as long as he breaks cleanly, they're going to be pushing that pace. And with the number three Palace Coup drawn right outside of him, that's a horse that basically needs to be clearly in front to have any success. So you have to imagine that those two, at the very least, are going to hook up heading into that clubhouse turn and the number 11 uh, C falls that horse also has to break uh, sharply from the outside and try to get forward because he does all of his best running when he's on the lead. So it feels like all three of those horses have to hook up. Um, you can make a case that each one of them fits well in this race, but I have trouble seeing any of them shaking clear to actually be successful to win the race. Um, I do agree with you that Pat's property would be really tough off that last out speed figure. And I'm not doubting the number. I would say that both this horse and the winner, Bourbon Frontier, took big steps forward that day. And they were the two that were kind of up close throughout. Bourbon Frontier was a horse that was going out for the Wayne Potts barn. And Wayne Potts has had some horses make surprising improvements recently at Oaklawn Park. So uh, maybe maybe that horse did run a legitimate number last time. As for the horse that you brought up on the front, Craig, uh, you might remember I had a thing for this horse back in 2020 when he was running in some three-year-old maiden races at Oaklawn and then eventually tried Allowance Company. Uh, he just is like the quintessential plotter. He has no early speed. He just drops out the back door and hopes that the race falls apart. And that really might happen here. I, I do think he might want a little bit farther than a mile, but given the pace that signed on, maybe it, the speed does come back to him. I do think he'd have to step up and run a faster speed figure to beat this field, but he's going to get the right kind of pace scenario. And I do think you're going to get somewhere around that 15 to one morning line. So he's a horse that I kind of earmarked as a backup in this race. I, I didn't make him among my top picks. Um, the horses that I would say I'm most interested in Craig and the ones that I'd want to lean on most heavily in a pick five sequence. And uh, I'll, I'll let you give your take on that after I mentioned them. One of them is the number two Santos Dumont, who is a uh, 12 to one on the morning line. This just feels like a horse that's well suited to the flat mile. I don't think he wants to go a step beyond that. Uh, he, when he was running last year, he showed that he's a horse that doesn't always finish off his races that well. He's kind of got a nice turn of foot in him. He can, you know, forge to the front end coming to the top of the stretch, but he can flatten out sometimes after that. But I do like him coming back off the layoff here, given the pace signed on, because he is a horse that can pass horses and come from off the pace, but he doesn't have to be nearly as far back as Hump the Front figures to be. And also, he's switching into the barn of Chris Hartman, and if you haven't been paying attention, over the past five or six months or so, the Chris Hartman barn has just been winning at a very strong rate. It seems like all their horses are running. The ROI is really healthy. Uh, so I, I think that even though he's coming out of Steve Asmussen stable, getting into the Chris Hartman barn is a good thing for almost any horse right now. So uh, I think Santos Dumont is very interesting in this race. And the other horce that I like is the number five, Myopic. Uh, Robertino Diodoro has two runners in this race. Uh, one of them is the Speed Palace Coup, but I think Myopic could kiss it a good trip just stalking the pace. He might be the first one that makes that move if the leaders come back to the field. And 
If he ran against a horse last time in Run and Ray, who's just in great form right now, Run and Ray came back out of that eight length victory to win against a tougher allowance field next time with a similar speed figure. So I feel like he backed up that form and Myopic just had no chance to back against some better horses like uh, Last Samurai and Superstock. So I think he fits well here. And if the pace doesn't completely fall apart, I think he's the one that might be able to make the first run on those speeds. Well, I'll uh, be 50-50 on your horses. I, I like your horse, the two. Uh, you got into Chris Hartman. I think he's got another horse we will talk about later on the card that's similar. But, yeah, he's been on fire. So I, I have no problem. I actually have him on my tickets for sure. Myopic, I, I do worry that he's a horse who basically never passes anybody. So I'm wondering, I, I kind of have him slated in as a speed horse. So I, I have my doubts on him. He's one that I think the pace is really going to harm in here because he wants to be up close and it's just one I think it's going to get a little too hot for him. One more note I did want to make on the Pat's property race with that speed figure and a reason that I do like him in here is because two horses have come back from that race. Now, admittedly, uh, actually three have come back and they've all improved their speed figure at least 10 points. Uh, but now two of them have won. Kershaw came back to, to win and Rever Echo came back to win. They did both drop in class pretty substantially out of that starter allowance from a 20,000 and the other two at 10,000. But they did it the way you want to see. They ran much improved figures, won easily. So I, I do think that figure is pretty legit. So I, I'm definitely going to uh, be using him uh, in verticals for sure. You know, Craig, we haven't even mentioned the morning line favorite in this race, and I don't know if he's actually going to go favorite, but I think we should at least uh, touch upon him, and that's the number 10 prioritization uh, going out for uh, Scott Becker's stable. Uh, Scott Becker's actually had some success at this Oakland meet so far. I know he's a trainer that typically racks up a high percentage at lower level circuits. Um, but prioritization, he is one of those horses that faced off against Pat's property back in December and came back to win out of that race. Uh I wonder about the quality of competition that he faced last time, and now he's moving up in class into a tougher race. Uh, so what's your take on him? He's another that's probably going to be in that second vanguard stalking the speeds. Yeah, and that's uh, I kind of had the same thing with him. He really doesn't pass horses. I mean, he, he won the last race. Uh, he was a length and a half back early, but he's one that wants to be right up on the lead, and I suspect it's just going to be too hot. So if you're not on the lead, if – Whoever the speed of the speed is, um, I would like. That's why I'm kind of going with Pat's property because I think it might be him. But otherwise, I think all the speed horses are going to be in trouble. As you mentioned, it could be others. Sea Falls, the 11. Uh, I actually think he could be the speed of the speed if he's really gunned that would make him dangerous but th this race is a tough puzzle and it's one in the pick five i'm going to spread fairly wide because i think a, a, a lot of different scenarios could actually play out let's move on to the 10th race uh the middle leg of this pick five sequence and it's another maiden special weight for the three-year-olds but this one is going a sprint distance six furlongs and Craig, I think we've got to start this race by going all the way to the outside and just discussing what happens if the one also eligible entrant, the number 13 slim man, gets into the race and what we'll do if he does not get into the race. Because I know he's listed at five to one on the morning line. If this horse draws in, though, isn't it going to be like eight to five? I mean, this horse is coming out of one of the fastest maiden races that we've seen run anywhere in the country for the three-year-olds finishing behind favorite outlaw last time and he's going out for the powerful brad cox stable with john velasquez named to ride uh, obviously florent Giroux, uh, cox's main rider is going to be in saudi arabia on saturday which is why you see some of these riders which is away from Giroux at oakland park but uh slim man off his last race he's gonna be tough for this field to handle yeah, this is a race that's a big field. There will be 12 in the gate, most likely. We have uh, the also eligible Slim Man as the 13. Uh, he would definitely be the horse to beat if he gets in. I assume that morning line is because he's an AE. Uh, I'm not sure you would know more about how you handle them than me. But yeah, he's going to be the favorite if he draws in. And outside of him, I, I still, even if he doesn't draw in, I, I don't think the contention in this race runs all that deep. Uh, outside of him, stayed in for the half, stayed in for half from uh, Steve Asmussen. Certainly ran a big race first time out. Uh, I think he would probably be about eight to five if Slim Man doesn't draw in. So um, 
There's not a whole lot more in this race for me. Maybe Lundberg, the six horse, who's on race coming in for Brad Cox. But this is a race where it's a big field, but I think there's a lot of filler. And I think the contenders are pretty obvious. Yeah, we agree about this one. This is not a race where I'd want to go too deep. Um, and I, I would say T-O-O deep, not, not, not the number two deep. Um, with uh, <laughs> If Slipman gets in, I think I would focus uh, on him a little bit because I really have no knocks against that horse. Uh, I thought he ran really well last time in a race that looks legitimate. And as for stayed in for half, the other horse that you mentioned to would probably inherit the favorites role if that also eligible does not get into the race. Uh, I went back and watched his debut at Fairgrounds and I liked a lot of what I saw. I mean, the one weird part about it was that he was a Steve Asmussen first-time starter that went off at 20-1, to 1, uh, but he actually ran like he should have been a much shorter price because he um, showed good early speed, kind of had to be ridden to go after a runoff leader in the early stages of that race, and I know the, the running line never shows him more than a length and a half back, but the leader kind of got further away than that on the far turn, and this horse really had to be ridden to go after him, but you could see that he kind of re-engaged once some horses ranged up to his outside coming to the top of the stretch, and he he actually was going to win the race coming into the final 16th of the mile, but it looked like he greenly sort of ducked away from something and lugged in in really just the final 110 yards or so. And that caused him to lose the race by a half length. But he lost the race to a horse, Zozos, who I think we talked about on the pace cast a couple weeks ago. He came back for Brad Cox and won his next race by over 10 lengths, stretching out in distance. So I think that was a pretty strong race that stayed in for half comes out of. And he just looks like uh, one that would be pretty tough, especially if that also eligible does not get in. You were mentioning so that there were some first-time starters that could be interesting. Uh, the number six, Lundberg, I, I, I'd prefer him less of the two Brad Cox runners if uh, if Slim Man gets into the race. I just feel like Brad Cox often gets overbet with firsters. He does not have nearly as strong numbers as he does with horses that have experience. So I would look to go against him a little bit. The firster that really does interest me, though, is the number 11, Plausible Denial. Uh, this horse cost uh, quite a bit of money at the March uh, 2021 sale after working a furlong in nine and four fifths, and I thought did so really impressively. And I think I talked about it on our Oaklawn show with Emily uh, a couple weeks ago that uh, James DeVito has really strong numbers with first time starters in dirt sprints. Over the past five years, he's six for 29, 21% with an ROI that's nearly $4. That horse that I had kind of highlighted that stat for at Oaklawn Park. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, he actually ran really well that day. He just missed it, I think, 11 to 1 and got an 80 buyer. So uh, this trainer knows how to get a first-time starter ready to buy on debut. And this horse, Plausible Denial, even though he's by Pioneer of the Nile, there's a lot of sprint pedigree on the dam side. He's a half-brother to horses Jake and Elwood and Lucy and Ethel, who were both really nice sprinters who earned some big speed figures. So I think he is a, a very interesting first-time starter coming into this race off some pretty quick-looking workouts. Yeah, I can see him for sure. It's just that, uh, as you said, the horses you've already run are going to be tough because this is a pretty strong maiden race. As you mentioned, with Stay for the Half, Zozos came back to win. And so did the horse that finished in third, uh, strong quality. Uh, he came back to win at a maiden special weight stretching out. So definitely a really strong race. And that's why I tend to, to downgrade the firsters in here because they would really have to be something uh, pretty good to win in this field. Let's move on to the feature race on this Saturday card at Oak Lawn. It is the Grade 2 Rebel. A million dollars is the purse going a mile and a 16th on the dirt. As I said, 50 Kentucky Derby qualifying points on the line for the winner of this race, or at least for 10 of the 11 runners that are signed on to compete in this race. Uh, but, uh, Craig, I guess we do have to start the conversation with the number two, New Grange, who figures to be a heavy favorite. Nine to five on the line. I could see this horse going off at even money or less, though, just kind of based on the allure of an undefeated horse for the Bob Baffert stable. It feels like these always get a little bit overrated at some point when they keep on winning. Um, and Duke Grange, he did beat a lot of the horses that he's facing once again here in the Southwest last time. And I was not blown away from a visual standpoint by a Southwest, but he has improved his speed figure in every start. And I don't deny that he's the most likely winner of this race. Yeah, it's kind of hard to get past them. I, I was actually impressed with his last race just because uh, looking at the trip, it didn't seem all that ideal to me. The pace was pretty fast. He was right up on it. I actually liked how Johnny Velasquez was able to take him back a little bit. And I thought he made a nice run to, to just kind of 
win easily in the end on the turn i thought he was in deep trouble and he was able to get the job done so this time he draws inside um I guess the only real danger is somehow that inside post to me would get him involved in the speed duel. If some horses try to get in from the outside, maybe he could get would get shuffled back. But I'm with you. He's clearly the horse to beat. For me, the, the main thing I was looking at was, you know, who are the horses who could possibly beat him? And I think what happened in the Southwest probably flattered a lot of horses uh, and made them look better than they really are. Uh, horses like Barber Road, who's 9-2 to two on the morning line. Um, I mean, it's a race where we have all the fractions in red. Uh, the, the pace figures early were in the 140s and the 130s. So they were flying pretty quick. And, and I think a lot of horses got better than, uh, they're better than they uh, don't look as good on paper, or they look better on paper than they actually looked when I watched the replay. Um, as I said, Barbara Robe was one. I think Ben Diesel, he was a horse I wanted to try to make a case for. But when I watched the replay, that horse actually just got the perfect trip, and, and he wasn't able to to really threaten New Grange. So for me, the one horse I, I was able to come back to and, and would use along with uh, New Grange is the horse drawn to the inside, and that's Kavad. He was the horse actually setting that pace. He was pressured by a big long shot in there. They set fast fractions, and I really actually liked how he dug in. He actually looked like he was going to be second until about the uh, inside the 16th pole where he just kind of gave it up. But I think with different pace dynamics, he actually could be the main danger in here, and he's going to be a much bigger price than some of the others. Yeah, I, I agree with you about how this pace is going to shake out. I, I think that New Grange, despite drawing inside, um, he didn't draw that far inside because the main pace rival is that horse that you mentioned, the number one, Kavad. And I don't foresee Ben Diesel being that aggressively ridden again like he was two back. And I don't think there are too many horses on the outside that are going to be looking to get in front of those two. So you would imagine that New Grange is going to be able to set up shop right outside of that rail drawn horse, Kavad. And uh, they'll probably lead the field early. We'll see how fast they have to go. I know there is that fast pace flag on the pace projector. I would view this as a race that probably will be run at a bit of a more moderate tempo. We'll see, though. I don't think it's going to be a slow-paced race by any means. Uh, but uh, I think it depends on if those two hook up towards the inside. I I hear you on Kavad. I, I, I agree about his trip last time. I just, I really think this horse is a sprinter. And he is eventually going to do much better for Chris Hartman when they turn him back to the races that he really belongs in, not these two-turn mile in the 16th or longer races. Uh, he did run well last time. I just, I just worry about his um, future potential going this far. Uh, but I, I'm on the same page with you uh, in a more general sense about the Southwest that I don't really want to take horses that finished behind New Grange trying to turn the tables on him in this race because I thought that he just ran a better race than most of the horses that he faced last time. I didn't think he had a terrible trip by any means, but um, he just was better than the horses that he ran against in the Southwest. So I wanted to look for some new faces. Craig, I've seen a lot of people making the case for um, some of the Steve Aspison runners, particularly chasing time. I know a lot of people have high hopes for this horse. He's a, a my racehorse runner. He's another not this time. I know Steve Aspison already has a very good not this time, an epicenter. Um, Chasing time, though, I feel like this horse really does have to take a step forward. I watched his last race, and I know it was visually impressive, but looking through that field, he really beat nothing. No, he didn't beat much. It was a really slow pace. Uh, the speed figure came back weak, and that was with what uh, we gave a, a pretty big pace upgrade in there to even get him to the 100 level. So, yeah, I I wasn't a fan of him. I am curious what you think of Ethereal Road because you, we talked about him a couple times in the prior maiden race, and he looked good visually coming out for Wayne Lucas, who seems to be having a bit of a resurgence. He has some runners this year, and... He's been jumping up, uh, increasing his speed figure in most of his races. He's seen, other than the time it was a muddy track. Ran a 102 last time. Is he one you could see to, uh, making a big jump? Yeah, I um, I actually picked Ethereal Road in this race, and I am uh, very interested in this horse. I will say, anybody out there who has not watched Ethereal Road's maiden victory last time from January 29th, do yourself a favor and go look up the replay because it is a remarkable performance. Uh, this horse, 
I don't know exactly what happened coming out of the starting gate. It looked like he just kind of hopped and took an, a stutter step start, but it completely threw him off stride. And he spotted the field a good five lengths, just a few strides away from the starting gate and had no momentum heading into that clubhouse turn. And he was way out the back of a pack early. And you know, Craig, we talked about some of the speed horses that were in that race when we handicapped that maiden race in race eight today. And that was not a pace that fell apart by any means. Yet Ethereal Road made this gigantic move coming around the far turn like he was the reincarnation of Silky Sullivan. I mean, he just looped the field and he was still a good six lengths back at the quarter pole, but he just ran right by them like they were kind of tied to a post on the stretch and ran off somehow to win that race by four lengths. I mean, that was a huge improvement on his prior form. And as you said, D. Wayne Lucas, he's been having a, a decent meet at Oak Lawn, especially with the dirt routers. He, in the longer races, he's gotten some winners home. Obviously, he has that three-year-old filly, Secret Oath, that we're going to see a little bit earlier in the day at Oak Lawn than the, uh, I believe it's the Honey Bee. Um, she looks like a heavy, heavy favorite in there, so it's not part of this late uh, pick five sequence. But uh, Ethereal Road, I was kind of looking back at his prior races for some clues to figure out where that last out effort came from. And if you go back and watch his race two back, that was run in the mud at Oak Lawn, if you, if you pay attention to this horse's trip, he really did not have a chance to launch a run that day. He had a subtle trip in that spot where he was just kind of held up in behind horses until the top of the stretch and didn't get out into the clear until it was way too late. So I, if I'm kind of like red boarding his last race uh, in a sense, but I mean, he, he had shown some potential before last time. So I don't feel like it was just out of nowhere that he improved in his last race. And look, he got a 102 time formula speed figure completely blowing the start. So I would be able to add a few points to that if he had gotten a clean break last time. And Newgrange got a 111 when he won the Southwest. So it's not like further improvement. This horse is completely out of the conversation. And I don't think he has to be quite as far back as he was last time if he's able to break cleanly in this race. And I, I think he's I think he's very interesting. And he's the only alternative that I, that I could come up with to the favorite. Yeah, that's kind of why I brought it up. I, I don't know, even as a numbers guy, how to how you put a number on a start like that because, you know, some horses they'll come back. Maybe it didn't cost them much, but I got the impression that it was pretty uh, detrimental for him. You know, so it, it wouldn't take much of a leap to think he's a horse who could crack the one ten mark off of that start. So he's the other one that's definitely going to be on my tickets. As I said, I think we agree. I, I don't really care for the other horses out of that Southwest stake. So. If you're looking for one that's coming from a different race, I, I do think he is is the one because I think that 102 it doesn't really show what he can do. I'm glad you talked about his last race because I was one his prior race. I was wondering if the mud maybe had something to do with that, and there's a good chance that it, we will have some moisture in the track, but it doesn't sound like that was the case. Yeah, and one more horse that I do want to mention briefly before we move on is the number six Stellar Tap. Craig, this is a horse that ran a big speed figure in his debut last summer at Saratoga, a number that would make him very competitive here if he could run it again, uh, getting that 109 time from U.S. speed figure. Um, he's been kind of a disappointment, but I do think he showed some signs of life at the fairgrounds last time. He didn't get a great trip in that race, was kind of boxed in for a long way. And we saw Pioneer Medina, who won that race, come back to just his third. He, he lost third in the photo with Zandon in the Risen Star last week. So... I think there are some things to like about Stellar Tap, and of the Steve Asperson runners, he's the one that I'd be most interested in if I was going to throw another horse that wasn't coming out of the Southwest on my ticket. Yeah, I can see that. I'm not a biggest fan. I, I do wonder if that 109 speed figure he got is actually accurate uh, because it hasn't proven to be a very strong race. Uh, neither him nor the horses coming back have been particularly good. Uh, it was probably one of their days at Saratoga with a lot of two-year-olds. Uh, I would have to look back, but... Yeah, I still think he would have some room to go. I, I understand uh, liking him more than the other Steve Asmussen, but yeah, I... I it's too big of a leap for me. So I, I'm going to go pretty short in here with New Grange as an A and Kavad and um, Ethereal Road as Bs. And that will be about it. Let's wrap things up by talking about the final leg of this sequence. It is an Arkansas-bred optional claiming allowance race going six furlongs. 
for three-year-olds and up. And we do have some three-year-olds in this field that we might uh, talk about. But Craig, I think the horse that's going to take the most money is the number 11 rolling fork uh, going out for the short leaf stable and John Ortiz. This horse is coming off a pretty substantial layoff, but he's dropping back into Arkansas Bread Company after trying open company through last spring and summer and actually running pretty well in some races. Uh, he is getting significant class relief, but you do have to deal with the layoff. Yeah, and that's not really the strongest stat for uh, John Ortiz. He's not a big uh, layoff guy, but yeah, he, he definitely has the class. I, I do think you have to look at the pace in this race, similar to that allowance race we talked about earlier. There is a lot of speed in this race, which isn't really surprising. That's usually what you get in these Arkansas bread allowance races. So I, I do think you have to give that a look and... There are some others who I think could win this race. Uh, one of them that I looked at who's actually a bit of a price in here is 501, the nine horse. And in large part, it is because of that pace that I saw. If you look through this one's PPs, his last running line just looks terrible. He was beaten 18 lengths, uh, ran near next to last in a similar allowance race. But his PPs tell you this horse is a sprinter through and through. Every time he tries to go long, he just spits the bit, doesn't finish the race off at all. But he has a nice closing kick, so he's one I'm interested in for sure at a price on the turn back. Uh, another horse that, that caught my eye was Navy Seal, who is drawn more towards the outside in the 10 hole, but he's actually a horse who can run some mid-90s type speed figures. Uh, he's going to be coming from off the pace, so those are two I'd be using. I will definitely feature uh, Rolling Fork because I, I think the class edge is just pretty big coming in and out of those open races. It's something that we see fairly often when horses are competitive. Uh, in open class and move back into Arkansas breads uh, races. They're tough to beat, but I don't think it's a give me because of that, that layoff data for John Ortiz. Yeah. I was looking up some specific stats for John Ortiz uh, in formulator off layoffs of 120 to 240 days. He's just one for 26 over the past five years uh, with an 88 cent ROI. Uh, so not, not good numbers as you were noting for rolling fork, but if he gets back to some semblance of his form from last summer, uh, he's going to be a handful in this race. And it should be noted, even though he's coming off not one of his better efforts in that stakes at Charlestown last time, that was that um, Charlestown Classic night where it seemed like the rail was the place to be and this horse was outside the entire way. So I think it can be forgiving of that performance and his prior efforts just make him very logical here. And Craig, I'm glad you brought up both of those closers because I think that each of them are interesting. Uh, 501 for all the reasons that you mentioned were in total agreement on that horse. And Navy Seal, who didn't really look like much for most of his career, but it feels like he stepped forward very recently. Um, he was second last time to Garhole, who's just been a terror in these Arkansas bred races recently at this uh, current Oakland Park meet. So I can't fault any horse for losing to that one. And maybe Seal finished ahead of some common rivals that he faces again here again last time. So we'll see what prices these are. Um, I would uh, kind of be interested to see if 501 really is a much bigger price than Navy Seal. To me, they look pretty similar on form. If you take out that route race for 501, as, as you mentioned, you can kind of just draw a line through that. And his PP is some other horses that I do want to mention, Craig. Um, as for the speeds, are there any of them that you'd want to use in this race? The number seven Heritage Park has run some big speed figures on occasion, but he is one of these horses that just needs the lead to be successful. And the number eight Mo Choctaw, a horse that has taken a lot of money in both career starts, but he got involved at a pace last time and just really did spit the bid. He had, he had nothing left late. So do you view these horses having any, having any chance? Do they just kind of cancel each other out? Yeah, I think they kind of cancel each other out, especially a horse like Heritage Park. He he can just go so fast early sometimes, but he's been doing it in claiming races. Uh, he's never, I mean, he's won an allowance race at Prairie Meadows, but much less purse than this. And I mean, it's always possible if you get a speed horse and they get loaned, they get brave. And, and you know, the, it's not like the closers in here are Silky Sullivan types coming to get them. But I just had a trouble had trouble making a case for any of them in here. Yeah, there are two other horses that I do want to mention. One of them is the number three, Goodnight Archie. And I know that he's shown up close to the pace here, but 
I don't think he's a horse that needs the lead to be successful. He's probably better coming from just off the pace. So I think he's going to let the seven, the eight go, uh, those two speeds we just mentioned, and sit just off them. And we'll see how fast the pace ultimately turns out to be. But he is another horse that ran right behind Garho last time. And I would say, based on the pace, he actually ran a stronger race than Navy Seal. Uh, maybe Navy Seal is going to get the better pace situation to run into again this time. But I thought Goodnight Archie ran pretty well last time. And even though he didn't um, achieve the same kind of result two back, he was coming off a layoff that day and he was running at a higher level. So I think he dropped in class at its last start. And um, he's getting a, well, I would term a rider upgrade to Ricardo Santana Jr. So I, I think he's interesting. And also the number four, where's Randy? a horse that has had some trips in his races. He is one of these three-year-olds that's stepping up to face older horses, something that you don't see a lot of at this time of year as early as February. Um, but, you know, he did run a nice speed figure two back when he got that 90. And last time out, he was a decisive winner. I know he only won by a length and three quarters, but he was much the best that day, making a big, impressive move into a slow pace. And he, he's a very green horse uh, still. He's been all over the place in his races. He ducks in, ducks out. It seems to resent the whip. But if where's Randy ever ever figures out how to run straight, I think we're going to see a, a speed figure improvement from him. Yeah, I could see that. Good night, Archie. I would view more as a, a win candidate than I would where's Randy because I could see him falling into the perfect trip. Just as you say, on the pace projector, he's shown uh, outside a couple of those speed horses we talk or inside almost even with them where in racing, horses just aren't going to run like that. He would drop back a little bit, I'm sure. Take that pocket trip and, and probably get the jump on the closers. Uh, whereas, where's Randy? I think he's still got a little bit of work to do, but he's going to be a price. He's the kind of horse I would try to get into vertical plays in because he's definitely going to be coming late. When you look at his PPs, he's always passing horses late. So uh, I got no problem with him. He's not for me in the pick five, but he, he could be one to... to throw a wrench into things. All right, let's do a quick review of how we might construct these tickets. Craig, I don't think this one can be that difficult because I know you were mentioning likely going thin in a few of these races. Um, I'll let you start and then I'll and then I'll kind of fill in where how I differ from you. Yeah, in race eight, uh, I'm not going too deep in this one. Uh, there's a couple maidens. I, I think we both agree quick to blame is going to be tough to beat. Uh, I'll have a lot of my money on him and I'll use Ryder special as well. Uh, in the ninth race, the allowance race, I'm definitely going to spread a bit more. I think this one is wide open. The pace could get crazy, so I think a lot of scenarios could be a play. I'm going to use horses like Pat's Property, Sea Falls, maybe. Uh, if he's able to get clear, Hunt the Fronts, the closer I like. And there were a couple others we talked about, so I'm definitely going to cast a wide net in, in that one. In the maiden race, uh, the maiden special weight, uh, I'm going to be thin in this one. If Slim Man gets in, I think you got to use him prominently. Whether he gets in or not, I'm going to use Stayed In, uh, stayed in for half because I, I think he ran a strong race. And then I'll probably use a couple of the first-time starters, uh, that the one you mentioned for uh, DeVito and, and maybe Lundberg a little bit. Um, and then the Rebel, I'm going to be pretty short in there. I'm going to use New Grange prominently and then use his backups, Kavad and Ethereal Road. And then the 12th, we just kind of talked about, I'm going to look for some closers in 501 and Navy SEAL uh, and then use Rolling Fork as well. Yeah, uh, we're, we've got a similar strategy here and just some different horses in a few races. Uh, in the eighth race for me, that first leg, I'm... I'm not against quick to blame. I'm probably going to use him in equal strength with Western River. Those are the two that I like. And the others, uh, like Curly Tail that I mentioned, they would be more distant backups for me. In the ninth race, I like Santos Dumont and Myopic. Uh, most of my play would go through those two. And I would have some backups in there, like Pat's Property and Hunt the Front, uh, to the two horses that Craig likes. Uh, in the 10th race, um, I'm going to, again, like Craig said, just really stay with the logical horses, uh, stayed in for half and slim man with maybe a bit more emphasis on slim man if he does get in the race. And also I would use that first or plausible denial uh, pretty prominently, either as an A or a B in uh, that 10th race. In the Rebel, uh, I'm, New Grange is an A for me. I'm not going to take a big stand against him. 
but uh, I do want to use that number 10 ethereal road as uh, either an equal strength or my main backup. Um, I, I do concede that Nuke Range is a much more likely winner than ethereal road, but I do think ethereal road will offer some value. I think he's going to be somewhere in that 10 to 1 plus range. Uh, and then to close things out, this would be the race where I probably have to spread the most uh, because I, 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 there's nobody that I want to lean on that hard. I do like Goodnight Archie. I would use Rare, uh, Where's Randy in a pick five sequence, and the number 11 rolling fork is just too logical not to use. And I would want to have both of those closers in there. Perhaps uh, I like 501 a bit more than Navy Seal, but they're both, um, you know, A's or B's for me. I, this is a race where I would want to use all five of those horses in some combination, uh, some of them A's, some of them B's. Uh, but I think I'm going thin enough in the other legs that we can afford that. Yeah, I did want to mention early when you were talking about Santos Dumont, I said we'd be talking about a Chris Hartman horse later, but I didn't mention it was him. It's Kavad. I mean, I'm sure most people with past performances could figure that out. Uh, he's a horse that was claimed for 50000 and he's done a really nice job with him. So just I wanted to get back to that because I forgot to bring it up when I talked about him. Yeah, that barn's been on quite a run recently. I know they've, they've always done a good job, uh, Chris Martin, Hartman Stable, but especially if, you know since they've gotten some better horses over the past six months or so they've been on quite a roll so we'll see what Kavad can do against that big favorite new Grange in the rebel uh Craig it does feel like this Kentucky Derby picture is kind of starting to take uh, a shape though it feels like we still have a lot to learn uh things are kind of up in the air with regarding the point system still with those Bob Backett runners participating and likely to have another one that uh maybe isn't getting points or some others being deprived of points by new Granger's participation in this rebel but uh you know we'll see how that all shakes out but it does feel like uh, we're starting to see some better performances on the derby trail yeah we start last week started i think was the first 50 point race uh it's going to be a weird year because as you said a lot of points haven't been given out because of all the uh Bob Baffert horses who have been winning. So a little too early for me to get too excited. I still view these this level preps as just preps for the next round more so than I do the Derby when things really shake out because of the way the point system is structured. I do think it's a little silly how some of the races early on are only worth 10 points when, you know, we're two months from the Derby at this point. Uh, so I guess moving into 50 now, uh, We'll start to see more, but yeah, I still view them as preps for the 100-point races. Yeah, the, the derby point system is not my favorite qualifying method, but I guess we've had more flawed ones in the past. So we'll, uh, you know, the, the connections know what it is and they work within it uh, to get their horses to the race. Uh, the last prep for all these horses is the only one that really matters in the end. And I think we'll be seeing a lot of changes before that last round of preps in late March and April and a lot with a lot of these horses. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we get there. For now, the focus is on this Rebel card. And Craig, we'll recap the Rebel and we do our pace cast on Tuesday of next week. And any other races this weekend at Oakland, probably that honeybee that do earn uh, speed figures that are worth talking about. Remember that you can always catch these podcasts on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Wherever you get your podcast, just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Thanks for tuning in this week and make sure to catch that Time Form US Pacecast coming up next week.